as Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> he did an hour and a half. Uh, it just it was, it was exactly my journey from home to here, actually. So. <laughs> and then he and he wrapped up. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately, not for good. Um, but I'm going to do two slots, and I'm going to try and keep them snappy because it's important stuff we're doing today. So. Uh, just a bit of background. When I when I first met Nigel in, in 2007 uh, at, uh, at the uh, East India Club over Brace of Brass, as you can imagine, uh, he asked me what I thought of the UKIP brand. And being new to the party and a branding consultant, I told him it was old-fashioned and clunky and outdated. And he agreed. As I became a more active member of the party, I realised a vital thing about the UKIP brand. Uh, and that is that it is growing. It was growing. It was becoming better known among the voting public day by day. People were getting to recognise it as we got more TV, we appeared more and more on ballot papers, more people were understanding that UKIP was a real political force that stood for one main thing, which was leaving the EU. We still had a long way to go back then, of course. We had virtually no local councillors and stood at around 2-3% to in the polls, a position we visited again recently. But Nigel was getting more TV and we gained 12 MEPs and beaten the Liberals in the 2004 European election and we had two new members in the House of Lords. Now one thing you know as a brand consultant is that you never mess around with a brand that is gathering awareness. So now fast forward to 2016. UKIP has continued to build its brand awareness and become the first new party to win a national election in a century. 27% in the 2014 Euro elections. We took almost 4 million votes in the 2015 general election, which saw the Tories gain an overall majority because we forced them to promise an EU referendum. Yeah. Yeah. And, losing it. and then we fought and won the EU referendum, the largest democratic vote ever taken in this country. But by the end of 2016, it was clear that that victory had come at a price. From June onwards, people had been saying to us, congratulations, brilliant job, fantastic result. I expect you'll be packing up now, won't you? In spring 2017, we saw the full horror. In the terrible combination of county elections affected by the announcement of an imminent snap election called to boast of Mrs May's Brexit mandate, we were comprehensively marmalised. Now, some of our troubles have been of our own making. The post-Farage era was always going to be necessary but difficult. Some of our wounds have undoubtedly been self-inflicted, but the predominant factor has been the widespread belief among the public that UKIP is the party for getting us out of the EU, and that belief, being widespread, is a victory for us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but the point is, the widespread belief is that we were, we were the party for getting us out of the EU, that we are now getting out of the EU, and UKIP therefore has no purpose. We've heard it on doorsteps throughout the country. Some of our own members, including activists who have distrusted the Tories for decades, voted Tory in June. A million of our voters returned to Labour, believing that Corbyn was a man of principle who would support Brexit. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> it, I, I had to remember to put some jokes in. Uh, as I said earlier, you don't mess around with a brand when it's winning, but sometimes the market tells you it's time for change. Brand theory is actually quite simple. A brand is a reason to choose. It helps people identify you against the background of your competitors. It's a set of true, clear values and messages represented by a name and a visual symbol, usually, that helps people choose between you and another offering in your market. From 1995, when the UKIP lo pound logo was invented, to 2016, when the country voted for Brexit, the UKIP brand presented a clearly defined promise different from that of every other serious party. Now we've achieved the country's Brexit vote, and it is up to the government to deliver it. Of course, we have to be around to make sure they do. But how do we stay around? How do we attract members? How do we attract donor funding? How do we attract votes in by-elections and poll ratings, which are equally important, by the way, when our market think we've done our job? That is why Paul Nuttall, with the NEC backing, asked me last year, as an ordinary member of the NEC, 
with experience of branding and a reasonable grasp of what makes the party tick, to conduct a review of the brand ready to relaunch the party at this year's conference. So this is not a preemptive strike by me as an unelected interim leader to redefine the party before the new leader gets their hands on it. My job is not to redefine it. My job is to answer the question, what is UKIP beyond the Brexit mission? Not to change who we are, but to explain it without the easy out of EU slogan. Not to disrespect the logo we love, but to create a new look for the party that tells its past and potential customers that it has a new phase of existence, a continuing mission, and that they ought to consider finding out about it and giving it their support. So down to business. A brand review means looking very hard at yourself and seeing what you really are. Unless it's something awful, you know, in which case you have a different problem. <laughs> so we need to answer the questions, why is UKIP still here? What does it stand for? And what is it trying to achieve for me, the voter? We needed to clearly define our mission beyond Brexit in terms that any voter can understand and remember and make us different from the rest. So we started by asking what are UKIP's core differential brand characteristics, what we call in branding our USPs, unique selling points. We believe that they are these. First of all, UKIP has one fundamental point of difference to the, main, to the other main parties, and that is this. We do not seek power for its own sake. If we did, we would be the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> We do not exist to create political careers, to defeat someone else, or to promote an ideology. We exist to achieve something through disruptive electoral power. We have a mission. If we do not have a mission, we should retire and let the career politicians fight over the trough. Yes? Thank you. Second, we are here to champion causes that others won't, either because they're too scared to, or because they've surrendered and are collaborating with each other. These are causes that the political and media classes have deemed to be off limits very often. But UKIP refuses to be gagged by these cowardly conventions or hobbled by political correctness. Do you agree? <laughs> now, the third thing is our causes are not pranky fans though they are always initially dismissed as such by the political media class. They are things that many ordinary people feel quietly within themselves. They are the common sense issues that seem to be being ignored or suppressed. They are the opinions that if only someone would speak up for them would turn out to have mass popular support. Because if people know what we stand for, and 20 to 25% of people say that they will vote for it, things change. Do you agree? Yeah. So, that brings us to UKIP's brand values, as we in Lovey Land call them. And they are these. We are mission-driven. We are challenging. We are libertarian. It says so in our constitution, and we should go on being. And we are democratic. So those are our brand values. But what do we stand for politically? Again, I am not trying to invest policy for the new leader, and I'm not going to. What I'm talking about are the core principles we have always stood for, that everyone in this party can subscribe to. And we believe that they are these. First of all, we believe in small government. We believe in the idea that the state is the servant of the people and not the other way round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are patriotic and we believe in the nation state. Yeah. We see our nation state as the United Kingdom, perhaps the most successful <laughs> in the United We believe in controlling both the type and levels of immigration into our nation state, and just as importantly, rights to citizenship of it. Right. 
We believe in an integrated society which preserves our culture and has shared values. Yeah. And we believe in justice and fairness before the law. Yeah. It, says here, it says here, do you agree? But I think you do. Yeah. So, again, in the language that we lovies would use, our brand positioning, the answer to the question, what does UKIP stand for politically, which makes it different from the others, is this. First of all, and let's be honest about it, UKIP is a nationalist and unionist party. We believe that the nation is a home, a family, and a force for good, where people can belong, be protected, and have the freedom to live their lives as they wish. Everybody knows it. We know it, our opponents know it, the commentators know it, and frequently say it. But for decades now, the left has decreed that it is a bad thing to be called a nationalist. Well, stuff them. <laughs> if it's good enough for the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh and the Cornish, <laughs> and the Catalans, it's good enough for us. And I have to say, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to have roared with laughter at the sight of Nicola Sturgeon tying herself in knots to try and claim that she doesn't want to be called a nationalist because it's a nasty word. <laughs> Second thing, there are three of these. Second thing is UKIP is an integrationist party. We believe that everyone who is or aspires to be British should be fully integrated into British society and respect our British values. <laughs> alienated minorities. We cannot continue the disastrous experiment in multicultural separation, creating ghettos where our laws and equality standards are ignored. Yeah. We've had enough, ladies and gentlemen, of multiculturalism and division and the self-loathing that has eaten our society from within. People come here from all over the world, not because it's a cultural vacuum or a blank sheet of paper, but because it's a good place to live. <laughs> and the third thing is this. You keep his, as we've said, nationalist, we've said integrationist, and the third thing is exceptionalist. Yeah, this is really going to annoy some people. Political scientists get quite excited about this. It's going to annoy perhaps quite a lot of people, but it should seriously cheer up everybody else. Stop and think, when did you last hear anyone in this country say, this is an absolutely excellent country. In fact, it's better than more or less any other you care to name in the world. And I am proud of it. Yeah. We don't say it, do we? No. We don't say it. We believe that the UK is a nation which has achieved more than most and contributed more than most to human progress and civilization. We are proud to belong to it and believe it has much more to offer the world. And we're not afraid to say so. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, our country is full of people who think the opposite of this. They think that nationalism and the nation state are outdated and wrong. They think that we don't have a culture worth asking people to ascribe to so they can just bring their own. They think that to believe your country is exceptional is just plain and simple racism. And the main problem, actually, is just that. The wrong people are teaching our children the wrong things. Yeah. You'll forgive me, I'm gonna use this word once. Gramscian Marxist educationalists <laughs> are teaching our kids that Britain is responsible for all that's wrong in the world and that we must renounce it in order to be redeemed. So we have campaigned for 25 years to get our country's sovereignty back, but there is a danger that we are so demoralised as a nation that we won't be able to cope with the responsibility. So UKIP's overall mission, post-Brexit, is quite simply national revival. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We 